to go to Malachi, the last, um, the last book in the Old Testament, or the last book in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, the last of the 12 uh, so-called minor prophets. And uh, the name uh, is interesting to begin with, um, although I have to be careful because it's very similar to uh, a very bad word in, in Greek. But in Hebrew, his name is derived from the word Malak, which means um, angel or messenger. So actually, it's not really certain whether this is truly his name or um, actually his, uh, his, his function. Um, but anyway, we know it as Malachi. And um, this is written uh, around 450 before Christ. Uh, after the Babylonian captivity, and the temple was rebuilt, and uh, um, the Jewish religion was uh, was restored, so to speak, but at the same time they had grown very lukewarm. The, their religion was weak. It's a very similar situation that we see actually today in the church, the Christian church. Um, we have everything uh, yeah, that we could possibly need. At least in the Western world, uh, we have our freedom uh, and everything, but um, the church is very weak and very lukewarm and filled with all kinds of other things. And so that is the situation where Malachi speaks. And also interesting is the way he writes, because he does not um, deliver a message like Jonah did or, um, for example, Jeremiah or um, Isaiah often um, uh, did. He is um, painting a dialogue between God and Israel. And, and this dialogue uh, exposes the problem and delivers the message. So we go to verse 13 of chapter 3. And I will read until verse 17 and then we look what it actually says there. Your words have been stout against me, said the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yeah, they that work wickedness are set up. Yeah, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spared his own son that serveth him. Okay. It has here the phrase... Uh, a book of remembrance was written before him, and that's titled Book of Remembrance, so I will get to that in a minute. But it's first God speaking in this uh, piece here, in verse 13. God says, your words have been uh, stout against me. God accuses the people of, um, of accusing him. Yeah, of calling him into account for what was happening to them. They were still in difficult times. Um, and, um, and they remembered, of course, the very recent, um, historically recent uh, problems they were in. And it wasn't over. It was uh, the, the, the Greeks were um, invading, and so there was a lot going on. And they were accusing God, basically, for this. And that's what God says, your words have been very stout against me. And it is very much what, again, we see today. People look at the, the news, they look at what's happening in the world, the wars, the, the famines, the 
disasters that, that happen where um, yeah, people die and lose their uh, their whole uh, life um, and uh, people then say why does God allow this to happen so they accuse God for for this and um, even those that do not say that they don't believe God they they often say this how can this God allow this to happen so they speak against God and and they they uh, yeah they blame God for not intervening as if uh, God doesn't listen but then in verse um, 13 um, yeah, in verse 13, they, they, you see that they, they don't realize that they are accusing God for that which they, they themselves are doing or causing. And so they say, what, what have we spoken against thee? In verse 13, they don't, they're not even, not even aware of what they are doing. What have we spoken against thee? And then God answers and he, he says, you have said... It is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? So basically the people said it's, it's useless to serve this God. It doesn't bring us anything. And so it's them actually that turned away from God instead of the other way around. And um, very much as we can see also in, in Psalm 37, uh, they look at the wicked ones and they see that they prosper. Uh, that is in verse 15. And um, they are even delivered. Right? So they, they they do very well, and we we are always uh, suffering uh, one way or the other. So what's the use of uh, serving this God? That is the picture here, the situation, and and again, it it is very very similar to our days, where we see both in the church people get wary of of let me say, doing their religion, and um, they think, what does it bring? We are still uh, in, in, in the same situation as those that don't, or even more so, they, they do better often. So why should we keep up with all this? And they seek other things that are more pleasurable, or they seek another religion, or they change their religion to, um, yeah, to have more personal fulfillment or uh, a better uh, experience. But then comes something very interesting, because the, the, the dialogue doesn't continue that way. It's not God against those people up and down. God has, uh, has said what he had to say. You have, uh, you have been uh, spoken stout against me, and uh, he has shown them what they have said, and there it stops. In verse 16, something else happened. It says that they, then they that feared the Lord spake often to one another. So there is a, another group within this uh, Jewish community, uh, among the children of Israel, a group, uh, a smaller group, that they feared the Lord. And so now the focus goes to that. And it shows the contrast of how miserable, actually, those are that try to accuse God for what they think that he does or doesn't do. Uh, this is contrasted against those that fear the Lord. Those that are actually faithful. And, um, yeah, it's again, it's, it's so similar to our times. It is, it is only a small group and it's also what is being prophesied and what we read, of course, in um, Revelation 2 and 3 about the church in the last days, uh, but also what Paul writes to Timothy. That is the situation. It's only a small group that will remain faithful and, and fear the Lord. And um, you can see the difference. Uh, they, they see that the others are not very godly. And they respond in a completely different way than the ones we, we just talked about before. They are not accusing God. It says, They that fear the Lord spake often one to another. So that says a lot, that, that small sentence. First of all, they fear the Lord. So that's, that's important. The others didn't, because they were even bold enough to, to talk against God. So they did not fear the Lord. But these, 
the faithful ones, they fear the Lord. Secondly, it says um, a bit further down at the end of verse 16, they thought upon his name. They thought upon his name. This is the second thing. And, and thirdly, they spoke often one to the other, which means they had fellowship. They were together and they spoke together uh, and they uh, thought upon the Lord. So these are the three things that we see. They fear the Lord, they thought upon his name and they fellowship one with the other. And, and that is uh, an example of how the church should function. And even more so in difficult times. Not accuse the Lord, not try to change the experience of the religion in order to feel more, uh, more happy or more fulfilled. No, uh, fear the Lord, th think on his name and have fellowship one with the other. Um, so I want to briefly look at these three things. First of all, they fear the Lord. And the, this is one, one way how the presence of God in the life of man should manifest. It should manifest itself in a deep respect. It is not fear of God's anger, but it is fear uh, not to offend him. It is um, uh, not forsaking the sin because you will otherwise be punished, but it is forsaking the sin because that is what God wants and you want to please God. It is not fearing the power that is able to crush you, but it is, it is fearing or deeply respecting that power, that same power that saved you. And once you see this, then of course there is this this fear, this deep respect. Uh, it's a healthy fear and it should be a, a normal thing among faithful people. And you see, even today, in many uh, quote-unquote Christian uh, denominations, there is no fear at all. There is all kinds of things happening and it is as if God is uh, their, their best buddy and uh, you can sing and dance and do whatever with God. But the fear, there is none. And that is not biblical. We see here they fear the Lord. And this is, um, uh, this is between man and God. It's man-God's relationship. Fear God. You understand what God has done and who he is. And as a result, you have this deep respect. So this is the dynamic between man and God. And then it says, they thought on his name. It is also, this is something uh, in, in our age, the, this is what people do not do, think. Simply, it's in, in not only with regards to, uh, to God, but in, in general, people don't think. Everything is, is fast, it's instant, uh, you don't think about it, uh, you just respond or reject. Uh, you see it, how it works on social media. Uh, uh, short messages um, and, or pictures flashing by and you just uh, click like or, or dislike and uh, you go on. Uh, if there is someone tweets you something, you respond right away. You don't think about it, you just respond and later you will find the consequences, of course. But that's our the way of how people work uh, nowadays. They don't really think. Um, yeah, this was quite different. Uh, Certainly in those days, but even in, in more recent history, when there was not, we were not so much bombarded with uh, all this media, um, and, and of course through technology, this, that has been sped up enormously. There was time to think, and we find it, uh, we find it in the old, in the New Testament, where um, Jesus um, finds uh, Nathaniel, who sits under the fig tree. And he is, he is meditating. This is what people did. They either read the word scriptures themselves, if they had access and, uh, and if they could read it, or they listened to it uh, in a synagogue or from, from a rabbi. And then they would sit and think about it. They would ponder on it. They would meditate on it. And this also allows God to work. And this is... This is what God also wants us to do. Also, when we read the word, not just read the blah, 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 and maybe with a small biblical um, calendar or whatever, and, and then move on. No, stop and think. Think what it says. Um, 
it is worth it. It's it's God and it's God's word. It's not something to just go by quickly and uh, in your mind uh, like or dislike, so to speak. Uh, no, uh, it is a way also to honor God. And it says they thought on His name. This is interesting because actually, uh, from from uh, the biblical perspective, God does not have a name uh, like like people have names. He has, you can say he doesn't have a name, or you can say differently, he has many names. Uh, but as always, uh, practically always, in the certainly in the in the Israeli culture, actually, it's whole Arabic culture is like that. Names always describe the character of the person. So names are not given before the child is born, but afterwards, days later. When the, there is some characteristic of the child um, that that emerges, and then the name is given accordingly, and it can even be changed later, uh, and we see this eh? uh, God Himself He changes the name of Abram into Abraham, or uh, Sarah into Sarah, or uh, Jesus calls uh, Simon Peter. So the name is changed. Why? Because the character has changed, and, and of course this is something God does. And we see it also here. Malachi is called Malachi because because of what he is. He is a messenger of God. And that is exactly what it means. And we find the word Malachim is, is angels. So, if we describe God, or a scripture describes God, it uses also all kinds of names, but because you cannot catch it in one name, obviously, or in one word. Um, all of scripture is not enough, but um, it is interesting to see uh, some um, some pieces of scripture to see what what uh, is uh, this, how God is described. So, for example, um, in in Isaiah nine uh, verse six, it says, "For unto us a child is born." Obviously, this is, this points to Jesus. Um, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called. And now you think, okay, his name we know. It's Jesus, Yeshua. But that's not what it says. His name shall be called the Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So these are descriptions of who he is and what he is. Which, uh, of, obviously, it's extra interesting because it speaks here about the Son. And it says he is the Everlasting Father. So we see that also that Jesus is... Is God, he's part of the Godhead. Um, much prior to that, in uh, Exodus 6, uh, verse 2, um, it is where, uh, where Moses wants to know, who is this God? What, who, when they ask who, the, who you are, what can I say? What is your name? And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abram, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, um, I was uh, was I not known to them. So he he identifies himself as being the same God that appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is very important. This God will repeat this throughout Scripture many times that he's the God of Abraham, uh, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, side note: not Abraham, Isaac, and uh, uh, Ishmael. Something of that nature, or Abram and Ishmael, it, it goes down to Jacob. Jacob is Israel, of course. And he says, I appear to them by the name of God Almighty. That's in Hebrew, El Shaddai. So that is, that is again, a description of who he is. He is the Almighty God. Almighty means more mighty than any other God. He is above any other God that um, man has made up or that Satan uh, makes up. He's almighty. And then he says, but by my name, Yahweh, and actually many Bibles say Jehovah, but I rather not use that name because of the, the negative uh, connotations it might bring up. Uh, and also it's actually not what it says. It says uh, the, the, the Tetragrammaton is um, mm -hmm. Yahweh. And um, they made this name Jehovah by taking the vowels of the word Adonai, and put them in between in reversed order, and this so this is constructed by man. This is not uh, this is not actually biblical, but okay. 
Yahweh is usually what we say. These four letters, they uh, they describe God. And then, again, you can analyze these these four Hebrew letters, uh, Yod, He, Vav, He, and you will see that in there, uh, I'm not going to do this now, but in there is even the mystery of um, of the crucifixion of Jesus. The, the, it points to the two hands that were pierced with two nails. So it's even that is in, in there. So that's the first time that we find this um, this name Yahweh, which will repeat then very very often throughout Scripture. And then in Exodus twenty uh, verse two, he says, "I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage." So here it says the Lord thy God. That's Yahweh. It says there in Hebrew. Now this we find it all the time. But again, there is a description. I have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It says what he what he uh, does. And of course, this is what he does to us. He frees us out of bondage of sin. And in Psalm 83, uh, verse 18, that man may know that thou, whose name alone is Yahweh, again, it's in Hebrew exactly this, art the most high over all the earth. So you are the most high. You are El Shaddai. And so these are just a few examples of the many uh, that there are in Scripture that describe God's name. And these Scriptures were uh, available in the time of uh, Malachi, obviously. Um, so this is what they were thinking about. They were pondering uh, upon the name of the Lord. They were thinking of who this God is, what he had done for them. And so they were not accusing God for uh, the things that uh, had not gone right, but they are actually honoring him for what he had done for them. Thinking upon the name of God is thinking upon his omnipotence, upon his infinite wisdom, his uh, omniscience, his, uh, and his everlasting, undying love that he has. All these concepts, the Jews of those days of Malachi, they knew it. Of course, they had, didn't have the revelation of the Messiah yet, but all the basis of the character of God, it was there. And they were thinking upon us. This is when believers, they that fear the Lord, come together in fellowship. This is what they should talk about, about God and about his work. That is the highest form of conversation. And they were not just uh, hypocrites doing some religion, as we will find later with the, with the Pharisees and the scribes, they, they were so legalistic. No, they were talking um, from what was in their heart. That is what they were talking about. And that is exactly what God wants us to do. Um, in Hebrews 10 verse 24, it says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So here we have a clear instruction. We should do this. We should assemble ourselves together and uh, not forsake it as some do. It says, this is what happens. People that begin to grumble and to to blame God for uh, you know, whatever uh, is bothering them, they will also not um, have joy in, in coming together with other believers. Why? There is no uh, no pleasure in that. And so they will either uh, forsake it or they will create something new that does not honor God, but that um, satisfies the self. And in Colossians uh, 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above and not on the things of the earth. That is the, the beautiful and clear contrast you see here in Malachi. The first group, they are talking about what they see on the earth. They see that they are actually always struggling and that the wicked ones are prospering. And so why, what's the purpose in, in uh, serving God? They were not looking up, they were looking around them. Uh, whereas those that fear the Lord, they had a, a relationship with God. They were thinking about the things of above, and they re 
use that to reflect on what was happening around them and then everything around you gets a whole different perspective. Uh, the simple fact uh, for them as, as Israelites to remember that this was the God that led them out of bondage, out of Egypt. That is the same in our lives. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard and it's difficult times, but then when we think, yes, but he's the one who got me out of bondage, of sin, he's the one that freed me, he did that. So it doesn't stop here. Yeah? What he has begun, he will finish it, as it says in Philippians and so, the other thing, what we see is they fellowshiped one with the other. They were not thinking by themselves, alone, in their home, uh, these things, which is, of course, also uh, good, and certainly was also the case, but they, they, um, they spake often one to the other. They had fellowship, had interaction. Uh, the life of a, a believer, of a righteous believer, Christian, uh, on earth, is... It's all the, the faith is always manifesting in a social way. It has to. Um, it will bring men together uh, because obviously, or, uh, or yeah, they are adopted in the same family. They become brothers. Uh, they have the same father. And um, in a, a normal situation, uh, brethren, they, they interact. They seek each other. So there we see a horizontal relationship that has to be there as well. You have corresponding uh, spiritual uh, experiences um, and they will discover when they are together and they, have, they think about the word, they discover that they have the same spirit, the same, uh, the same uh, revelation of, uh, of God and of his word. And... Uh, Again, in these difficult times, they also share the same hope. It's again the same in our day. We share the same hope, the blessed hope, as we wait for the return of Jesus. And you see that there are some that call themselves Christians that are not filled with joy and anticipation of his soon return. Um, something's wrong. We also share the same inheritance. So that makes us uh, the, the, makes us have many things that we have in common as um, true believers, and we like to share this. And so we seek fellowship, uh, as it says in uh, in First John, uh, if if you walk in the if we walk in the light, uh, we will have fellowship one with the others. So that that is an, an automatic result. And then comes an interesting uh, thing: uh, this this fear of the Lord and this fellowship. Uh, after that is stated in verse 16 of Malachi 3, they feared the Lord and spake often to one, one to another. So it speaks here about fear and about fellowship. And then it says, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. Mm -hmm. This is what God wants to see in his children. He wants to see that they respect him and that they have fellowship one with the other. And it, if you think of it from a human perspective, is it not logic? When you have children, as a parent, you have more than one child, you have children, wouldn't you want them to respect you and to have fellowship with another, to, to be able to, to, um, uh, to, to live together, to be, uh, not live together in one house, but to, uh, yeah, to literally have fellowship one with the other. That is what you want to see. That is what gives you joy as a parent. That is what gives God joy when he sees this. He hears it. He hears it. Um, he doesn't respond uh, like in the verse 13. Your words have been stout against me. There is there is uh, anger there. But in verse 16, no. Uh, he, he heard it. And then it says, And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. A book of remembrance was written. And so what is a book of remembrance? We actually know this. Um, I'm more surprised that it is in this uh, text 450 years before Christ because it's really something we know in our time when you go to, uh, to a reception, uh, maybe from a, a wedding or, or a funeral, quite different things, but uh, in, in both cases and in other uh, 
receptions, you often see this book where you can write your name and maybe a small um, a word so that um, the, the family or the host uh, later can see who visited this, this reception. And that is called the Book of Remembrance. Sometimes they call it a guest book, but it's actually, this is the official name. It's a Book of Remembrance, so that uh, it can be remembered who visited um, that particular um, occasion. Why? Because the people that, uh, that, that um, host it, uh, they want to remember, they want to know who was there. Maybe because they want to send uh, later on a card uh, to thank the people or whatever, but they want to know. So the Book of Remembrance is something so that you know uh, later who, who visited uh, a certain uh, occasion. Of course, God does not r need to write down a list in order to remember, but it is um, uh, figurative speech saying that he remembers this. Uh, as we see it also in, uh, in Revelation, uh, I think it's chapter 8, uh, where it says that um, um, the, the prayers are in heaven. God has remembered the prayers of the saints. He, he cherishes this. That is what it basically means. And the, the ones that fear the Lord and that have fellowship and that, that think upon his name, that, that have this deep respect for God, they are the, these hearts, they are known in heaven. God knows them. He, he remembers them. And um, God, God knows uh, knows His people. Obviously, the ones that are full and in a sweet, in, in taste, sweet way, talking, communing about Him. That is um, what He remembers. That should be our conversation. As we often say, our conversation is in heaven. That is exactly what we see here. It's recorded in heaven. And um, as the names are figuratively written in, in the book of remembrance, they are blotted out of the book of sins. Uh, the, uh, yes. Um, let's read this. Psalm 51. Huh? Um, verse 1. It's David crying out to God. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. And in verse 9, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. In verse 1, you see, he doesn't just say God. He says, God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. He is describing God. This is, the, this is thinking upon the name of God. This is what God can do. He is recognizing and honoring God by, by, by saying to God what, what he knows that God can do and has done. And so he, he calls upon this, um, uh, this, this uh, characteristics of God to use it to forgive him. And uh, of course he could not call upon Jesus because he didn't know, but that is obviously what, what um, what we should do, but not in that, not forgetting who this God is. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. As we are written in the book of remembrance, we are blotted out of this, uh, our sins are blotted out. Isaiah 44, another verse where we find this. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Interesting here is that God says that he has already blotted out the sins and then says, now return to me. And it's not the other way around. Jesus has already done the work on the cross. Also for those that have not yet um, received him into their hearts. The work is already done. It's a gift. You have to accept it now. God does not forget uh, these things. He cherishes them. His eye is upon us. Uh, I have to think of this. It's like um, uh, when you go to the beach um, in the summer or you go maybe to a playground, you see uh, the children are playing uh, in the sea, in the water, or uh, on the shoreline, or um, 
uh, on the playground they are climbing and doing things and the parents are sitting on the side and they are maybe talking with each other or maybe reading something but you see that at the same time they are continuously looking at their children their, their eyes are upon the children because they know something might happen or they walk too far away or whatever so likewise God's eye is upon us he does not lose sight of his children and uh, he notes what they do what they talk about how they have fellowship and how they fear him and he cherishes this and that he cherishes this comes then next in the response of God because in verse 17 God responds about this he says and they shall be mine they speaking specifically about them that fear the Lord not about the other ones that turn away from him and blame him but they shall be mine and I will make them my jewels I will spare them as a man spared his own son that served him so uh, this fear of the Lord uh, this, this manifesting faith uh, is, is crowned by God it's, uh, God rewards it this is what he wants to see in his children and he will spare them he says he will, he's, I will make them my jewels the jewels are um, the, the most uh, valuable thing that uh, in, in, a, in a human, uh, humanly spoken that we can have the jewels of the king the crown jewels this is the most uh, valuable that uh, most costly thing so uh, that's what he says they will be my jewels and I will spare them and he will not forget we a um, while ago looked at another verse um, in Isaiah 49 where it says behold I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands thy walls are continued before me so this is how how much God uh, cherishes this and and remembers this it's like we are graven upon the palms of his hands which means if you have something on your hands you will see it all the time as you use your hands for yeah, your daily uh, work. Um, and he says then that thy walls are continued before me. That was of course in the time that the walls were down, or the walls of Jerusalem were, were crumbled. And the Israelites were again in despair. But God says, I, I see them already standing up before me, so this is where I will take you. Again, ponder upon my name and you will know what I have done and what I will do again for you. God is aware. He remembers the acts. And this is a beautiful example of how we as a church and as individual believers should act. We should fear the Lord. We should have fellowship one with the other. We should think, meditate upon his name. Uh, you can say, study the word um, and, and not take that lightly, but... Um, uh, do it uh, seriously and, and take the time to ponder upon it. These three things are um, are yeah, basic, I would almost say, to have a good relationship with God and with our bro brothers. If we forsake that, we will be like the the first group there that are just grumbling and uh, dissatisfied with their religion they are dissatisfied with God and they will as a result also be dissatisfied with with their brethren and um, unfortunately that is what we see uh, too often in the church in the world obviously but even in the church fear the Lord ponder upon his name and have fellowship one with the other God cherishes it and he will remember it Amen